First Sentier Investors is a global investment manager with a focus on the future. With an active long-term approach, First Sentier Investors knows that the decisions made today will shape our future years from now. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Investing Compass. Before we begin, a quick note that the information contained in this podcast is general in nature, does not take into consideration your personal situation, circumstances, or needs. All right, so we're going to do another share deep dive today, and this one is listener requested. And this is a special one, Sean. So if you're a regular listener that drops everything, as we assume everyone is, to listen to Investing Compass as soon as it's released, You'll have noticed that this one was released at a different time, but we've actually done this for a good reason, Shani. Yes. <laughs> We're about to play the Warren Buffett drinking game. And this is something that we started very early on in Investing Compass, and it was to challenge listeners to drink every time you heard us mention Warren Buffett. And we thought this was a good episode to release at 6 p.m. on a Saturday because we think it's a more appropriate time for those playing at home. Yeah, no, exactly. It's better than the 6 a.m. Right. (laughs) And so we're going to, of course, be drinking while we do this. So excuse any slurring (laughs) at the end of it, uh, because this will obviously be a big one because we're going to do Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah, I think it's pretty folly of us to think that listeners are going to forego their Saturday plans to listen to us and drink every time we say Warren Buffett. I mean, maybe, but people can listen to their regularly scheduled time on Sunday morning, right? A fun Sunday morning. Yeah, very fun. Okay. So the other thing about today's episode is that when Shawnee was doing some research on this, she asked me a question about Warren Buffett's wife. And Shawnee did not know that Warren Buffett was essentially in a thruple. Yeah. <laughs> and he doesn't really seem like the type. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't. So do you want to summarize this for listeners? Well, the short story is basically he had a wife who was a performer and she'd perform at a club. And um, she wanted to pursue her singing career, so she moved away and asked some of the people at the club to take care of Warren because it was obviously a very busy man. So people would come to his house, clean, cook, do all that stuff. And one of the women he ended up having a relationship with. And she just basically moved in while his wife was in San Francisco. And then they just continued that way. The wife and the person that moved in would hold hands down the street. They would sign off. Christmas cards with Warren. So they'd be like, Warren, wife one, wife two. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's a lot of of intrigue, right? It is. There's a lot of scandal going on in Warren's life. Well, isn't the whole reason, and I I don't think he is anymore, but at one point he was the richest person in the world, Mm. isn't the whole reason of amassing a fortune to get women? Probably not. But okay. Well, for that's, me, I don't know. Well, that's Mark, but well, I think that's the motivating factor for a lot of people. Okay. And so he proved that right. But anyway, so should we get on with the game and, of course, the analysis of Berkshire Hathaway? Yes. So for those playing along, uh, but let's start with what Berkshire Hathaway is. Yeah. No. Absolutely. So Berkshire Hathaway is a holding company that is run by Warren Buffett. So it actually started out as a textile manufacturing company, and it was founded in 1839, and the original name was Valley Falls Company. And so over the course of the century, the company merged with other companies, including the Berkshire Cotton Manufacturing Company and the Hathaway Manufacturing Company. And so Berkshire Hathaway was born. They had 15 plants, 12,000 workers, and they had over $120 million in revenue. In 1962, along came Warren Buffett. Buffett started by investing in Berkshire Hathaway by buying shares and then took control of the company at a board meeting, naming a new CEO and closing the partnership to new money in 1966. And in 1967, Buffett expanded the company from just this textiles manufacturing business. And he did this by originally going into the insurance industry and then some other investments. And so basically what he did is he purchased these other businesses, so including the National Indemnity Company and Geico. And Geico still is a big core of the insurance operation of Berkshire Hathaway today. And he merged all of these together. And in 1970, he became the CEO and chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. So that's a little bit of history, but let's speak to what they do today. Berkshire Hathaway is a holding company that Warren Buffett and his partner, Charlie Munker, invest through. Business partner. Yes. Not another partner. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. No, there's not. There's not. What happens if you add someone to a thruple? 
Um, polyamory, maybe. Aren't you already there with two people? I'm not sure. Okay. Should we should we we'll, talk about investing now? Yeah, we'll get back. Okay. To, we'll get back to this. Maybe we'll do a whole episode and do some research first. <laughs> yeah, Morning Star Investing Compass After Dark. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So the old textile company is long gone, and they purchased publicly traded shares that you can buy that you and I can buy, like Apple, Bank of America, and Coca Cola, to just name a few of their biggest positions. And they purchased whole companies that they believe are promising, undervalued, and profitable. And they bought these businesses that are in the insurance sector, rail transportation, energy generation, et cetera. Basically, they just haven't restricted themselves to one particular industry or sector. They're just after promising businesses. And the myth around Buffett is that he is the world's greatest allocator of capital. And we've talked on here before how a big part of the job of every CEO is capital allocation and making the decisions about when and how much to invest in the business, how much to give back to shareholders and dividends and buybacks, and how much to spend paying down debt or going out and buying other companies. Now, in Buffett's case, what he's doing is primarily going out and looking for other businesses to buy. Those may be publicly traded shares that he believes are undervalued, and they may be whole businesses. And we mentioned insurance earlier, and one of the big drivers of how Berkshire came together was a particular component of insurance called float. And float refers to the cash that insurance companies take in to pay off future claims. And that float or cash, they have, they're earning returns on that. And so they obviously want to invest that before they actually pay it out. And we can use a simple example. So let's say you sell a life insurance policy. Well, at some point, you're going to pay that off because, of course, the person will die unless you've insured a vampire, maybe, Shawnee, because they are (laughs) immortal unless there's some sort of weird attack involving a steak or garlic or something like that. This is probably the worst joke you've ever made on investing companies. It's pretty awful. I thought it I thought it was actually pretty good. So if you can start a life insurance company for vampires, you'd be very rich. So like Dracula was five hundred and eighty nine years old in Bram Stoker's book. So you would just be collecting those premiums the whole time. You'd never have to pay them off. Yeah, if I lived to five hundred and eighty nine years old, that'd still be the worst joke I have heard. Okay. Well, let's get back to insuring the mortal. How about that? Right. right? So you collect all these life insurance premiums and then you eventually pay them out when the person dies. But in the meantime, you get to invest all of that money or the float. So Buffett bought these insurance companies and then used their capital to acquire other companies in Berkshire Hathaway. And this, in essence, is kind of a big case of compounding, right? He's using cash generated by companies that he owns, and then he's investing that in other companies. And as investors, we can do that. We can earn passive income out of our portfolios and invest it in other investments, which earns us more passive income. And eventually, we might be generating far more cash to invest from our portfolio than from our savings, which means at some point, you can start spending it like Mark is doing with dividends right now. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So let's take a step back and take a high-level view of Berkshire before going into a deep dive on the stock. So Our analyst believes that Berkshire Hathaway is much more diversified than a regular financial services company, which lowers its overall risk profile and offers um, a better risk-adjusted return profile than a lot of the other companies in the sector, and also a really solid candidate for downside protection during market sell-offs. He's also really impressed in Berkshire's ability in most years to generate high single to double-digit growth, comfortably above the cost of capital. But of course, there are some risks associated with the business's size and with a reliance on the main personnel. Yeah, basically what Shani is saying is that you can't move with agility when you're such a large business. And of course, that's what he's trying to do, take advantages of inefficiencies in the market. And the analyst is also saying that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are not spring chickens. So there is a little bit of uncertainty when they do eventually depart the firm and the earth, I guess, because (laughs) those two events will probably occur at the same time. But the departure may not have as much of an impact on future operating results as a lot of investors might think. When people think of Berkshire Hathaway, they think of Warren Buffett. The two seem inseparable from each other, but Berkshire's business model is decentralized. It has broad business diversification, high cash generation capabilities, and a really good balance sheet. So the departure may be more a twitch than an earthquake. A twitch than an earthquake, Johnny. Okay. Well, there you go. So even though Berkshire has these advantages, they have been overshadowed during the past decade because the company has had this huge cash balance. And they've, of course, earned next to nothing on that because it's such a low interest rate environment. 
But we actually think the company is going to focus on reducing its cash through a couple different ways in the near future. So over the past 12 quarters, the company has repurchased $58 billion worth of their common stock. And so that's around $4.8 billion per quarter on average. And this was 10% of the company's total shares outstanding. The company has got around $70 billion in cash left to fund acquisition, stock investments, and share repurchases. And as we've seen, valuations become more and more attractive. Many of the quality assets that Berkshire would normally purchase are coming into reach. All right. So promising prospects. So let's go in to the economic moat because we always talk about that and see if these strong prospects are long lasting. So the economic moat for Berkshire is a bit of a strange one because what we need to do is assess the economic moat of all of these individual companies that they own. But our analyst believes that Berkshire's economic moat is more than the sum of its parts, although the parts that make up the whole are fairly moaty in their own regard. Moaty. Mm. Wow. You're coming up with a lot of good stuff today. Thank you. All right. So (laughs) we're not going to go into each company individually as this episode will last into next year, but we'll give a quick summary of the main components and then we'll speak about Berkshire as a whole. So let's start with insurance operations. So Geico... Berkshire Hathaway Reinsurance Group and Berkshire Hathaway Primary Group are really important contributors to the overall business. They account for around 20% of Berkshire's pre-tax earnings. The insurance industry isn't particularly conducive to the development of sustainable competitive advantages. So basically, insurance is a commodity, except for maybe that vampire insurance I was talking about. And we've spoken about commodities on the show before, and it's just really difficult to get excess returns on a consistent basis when you're selling a commodity. And this is because buyers of insurance are not inclined to pay a premium for brands and the products themselves are pretty replicable. The competition between insurance firms is also very fierce and they're known to undercut competitors. So it's not just an industry, it's just not an industry where you can gain and maintain market share very easily. Yeah. And it's also one of the few industries where the cost of goods sold is driven by the claims people make. So if you have $100 million in claims in a year, that would, in essence, be the cost of goods sold that year, right? Because that's the insurance. And this cost of goods sold may not be known for a few years because there's a lengthy claim process and then delayed claiming. So there's more incentive for companies to sacrifice long-term profitability for near-term growth as they sell those new policies. We believe that some of the businesses purchased have no moat and some have narrow moats. When we look at the 70 plus non-insurance businesses that make up Berkshire's remaining subsidiaries, we see narrow and wide moats in the railroad, utilities and energy segments. In these categories, we see low cost and efficient scale that allows them to generate returns on invested capital in excess of their cost of capital. And then when we look at Berkshire as a whole, the fact that Buffett prefers to run the company on a decentralized basis means that the managers of the company's operating subsidiaries are empowered to make their own business decisions. So in most cases, the managers running Berkshire's subsidiaries are the same individuals that sold their firms to Buffett, leaving them with a vested interest in the businesses they run. And unless there's an incredibly disruptive event in the industries, we think that the firms that he has acquired will continue with the same competitive advantages and overall will likely maintain their narrow moats in aggregate. But overall, as we mentioned with Berkshire, the whole is worth more than the sum of the parts. Because of its broad business diversification, high cash generation capabilities, and really good balance sheet strength, we award it with a wide moat. First Sentier Investors is a global investment manager with a focus on the future. With an active, long-term approach, it knows that the decisions made today will shape our future years from now. First Sentier Investors offers specialist investment capabilities across a range of asset classes and actively engages with the companies it invests in. The investment manager brings together teams of active specialist investors who share a common commitment to responsible investment principles. Okay, so let's move on to risk and uncertainty, and we'll get the big one out of the way. So Berkshire depends on two key employees, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. And they make almost all of their investment and capital allocation decisions. And Buffett turned 92 in August and Munger is turning 99 in January. Do you still think you'll be working at 99, Mark? Well, you know, it's only a couple years away, Shani, so (laughs) so probably. (laughs) It's increasingly likely that the valuation horizon that our analysts use when they are rating Berkshire 
will exceed their lifespans, with the quality of investment returns and capital allocation being impacted. But as we've mentioned before, Berkshire is structurally sound. The decision-making has been delegated and functions of the business operate almost independent from the core, especially on a day-to-day basis. We also don't consider any environmental, social, or governance, or ESG issues at the firm to be material enough to warrant being a risk. So this is primarily because the industries where they have businesses aren't really impacted by that many ESG considerations. But we should mention Berkshire itself hasn't been without criticism when we look at governance. The makeup of the board committee and the unequal voting structure that they have has raised eyebrows in the past. But if we look at actual risks that they face, several of the firm's key businesses insurance, energy generation, distribution, and rail transplant, rail transport, <laughs> not transplant. These are all businesses that operate in industries that are subject to higher degrees of regulatory oversight. And that means, of course, if there are changes in the regulations that could impact the business in the future. And most of the company's businesses outside of insurance are businesses in cyclical industries. And that means that results do suffer during economic slowdowns. In saying all of this, these risks seem pretty minimal, and so our analysts have awarded Berkshire with a low uncertainty rating. Okay, so let's move on to something we briefly touched on before, that's capital allocation. And surprisingly enough, Shani, even though Buffett has this reputation as the world's greatest capital allocator, we have just given them a standard capital allocation rating. So when we assess capital allocation, we focus on a couple things. We look at the balance sheet. We look at the... um, effectiveness of their investments. And then, of course, we look at any shareholder distribution. So Berkshire's balance sheet is sound. The insurer's liquid investments generally exceed regulatory benchmarks by more than two times. And we also think that the capital investment decisions are fair and the capital return strategy is good. But maybe we should speak about that a little bit more uh, because it is a little bit unusual. Yeah. And what Shani's talking about is the fact that Berkshire does not pay dividends. So it has only paid a dividend once, and that was in 1967. And a well-known joke is that Buffett said that he must have been in the bathroom when that decision was made. With one of two women, or maybe both. (laughs) But anyway, not paying a dividend is unusual when we look at a company that is at the size of Berkshire and the maturity of Berkshire. So the simple answer is that Buffett believes that reinvesting the money in the company and its investments provides better shareholder value. And we look at the goal of capital allocation, that is it in a nutshell. What is the best way that capital can be allocated to maximize shareholder value? Our analyst believes that once there's a shift in management when Buffett is gone, Berkshire will probably be a bit more open to initiate a dividend. They might also accelerate the return of capital to shareholders through share repurchases, which, as we mentioned, they've been doing for a little while now, the equivalent of $4.8 billion per quarter on average for the last three years. Yeah, and we do think that this will only accelerate from now until 2026. We think that we think that because they've closed out the first quarter of 2022 with as Shawnee said earlier an estimated 70 billion dollars in dry powder and valuations are still running a bit higher than normal for many of the types of the assets that Buffett is interested in. So we don't think that he will deploy funds on further acquisitions or investments because he likes to acquire them outright and that would mean he would have to of course pay a premium. So we expect the bulk of the company's excess capital to continue going to share repurchases in the near to medium term, and also to some stock and bond investments as we see markets depressing and valuations becoming attractive. All right. So let's give a quick summary. We've got nothing bad to say about capital allocation decisions. We, we see Berkshire as having low risk, and we also give them a wide moat. So all in all, that seems like a pretty good track record. It does, Mark. So we don't just create drinking games of anybody. And here's the clincher. It's currently a five-star stock. We've seen Berkshire's share price become more attractive and believe it's currently trading at a 20 to 21% discount to our fair value. Yeah, so pretty good deal. But a couple of things about Berkshire. Berkshire does have two types of listings. So they got Berkshire A and Berkshire B. So the ticker symbol is BRKA, BRKB. So the A and the B denote the share class, uh, different share classes. And there's, of course, a good reason why there's two of them. And because Berkshire doesn't issue dividends and they're reinvested in the company, the stock price has continued to rise. In 1982, Berkshire's stock price was around $665. Now it's around 427000 So that's a growth of around 64,000%. That's a pretty amazing number, Shani. But it also shows that that $427,000 share price that if you want to acquire a share of Berkshire, 
most people, that would be most of the money they would have. And then, of course, it's very difficult to diversify. So that's where that class B comes in. So it was first issued in 1996, and it was originally a 30 to 1 ratio between that B and the A. Um, So that, of course, is the price, and then it's also the amount of equity in the company you own. But in 2010, there was a 50 to 1 stock split on the Class B shares. And so now the ratio is 1A share for 1,500 Class B shares. So the Class B trades at $282. And basically, just the difference between the two is Class B is actually affordable for smaller investors. And the shares can perform differently, although they are both investments in the same company. And this is really due to supply and demand dynamics at the market. So Class A shares slightly outperform Class B, but ultimately the fundamentals are the same and our analysts do not differentiate between the two share classes. So today we have two fair values for the company. So we can start with the original, that Class A, which on the close on the 24th of October was $427,169. And we have a fair value of $535,000. And then we can look at Class B. Last close on the 24th of October was around $282 with a fair value of $357, both at a 20 to 21% discount. As we mentioned, our analyst believes that Berkshire offers one of the better risk-adjusted return profiles in the financial services sector and is a pretty solid candidate for downside protection during market sell-offs. It has a wide moat, which means that it's able to keep competitors at bay for at least the next 20 years, generating excess returns above capital. Yeah, and they've also got low risk. And this is where the market might be a little bit nervous. So Berkshire, of course, is synonymous with Warren, and Warren is synonymous with Berkshire. So Warren and Charlie are getting older, as we mentioned earlier. And many investors are just unsure about the future of the company when their above average growth has been sustainable and maintained by those two men over the years. But the succession of the company looks to be stable and the risk is low. We think that this is an attractive opportunity as it stands, but obviously a key consideration with Berkshire is how important income is for you as part of your investing goals. Yeah. So for example, for me, income is one of the main things that I look for in securities. And so this may not suit the criteria that I've laid out in my IPS. And for me, it may be something that fits into my portfolio because income is not really a factor that I care about. But as I've mentioned a couple of times um, before, I do have to be cognizant that I have an oversized exposure to the US uh, because I do opt to receive part of my income in Morningstar shares. All right. So now we've touched on a couple of these points during the discussion today, but Berkshire Hathaway is a tricky business to understand. And it isn't tricky because the businesses they own are complex because they're all fairly straightforward, but it's tricky because of what it is in the aggregate. What is the sum of all these diverse parts, the Dairy Queens and the Seas Candy, and then railroads and insurance companies? There's obviously no synergy between a lot of these companies other than the fact that they generate cash And that goes into a giant fund that is invested by someone who many investors believe walks on water. And overall, conglomerates have gone out of style. Many investors look at these companies and can't figure out why all of these things are mixed together. These are very different business lines. Many investors prefer specialization and figure that instead of buying some company that owns a railroad and a fast food restaurant, they'll create their own diverse portfolio on more focused businesses. But in Berkshire's case... Many people overlook this. And why do they overlook it, Shani? Because of Warren Buffett. Exactly. So in conclusion, for those playing along at home, have one more big sip of your drink, because that is our episode on the star of the Berkshire show, Warren Buffett. We've also mentioned vampires, ruffles, <laughs> and yeah, I guess that's about it. Nothing else too exciting. And Shani made up a bunch of interesting phrases. But anyway, thank you for listening. Hopefully that gave you a little bit of insight into Berkshire. We, of course, would love any comments or ratings on your podcast app or send us an email to my email address, which is in the show notes. First Centier Investors is a global investment manager with a focus on the future. With an active long-term approach, First Centier Investors knows that the decisions made today will shape our future years from now. Any advice in this podcast is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives, situations or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.